Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. Uh, this morning, just by way of housekeeping, I want you to understand that the church office will be closed on Thursday and Friday of this week. Thursday and Friday of this week. If you have gifts and contributions that you want to be counted on this year's uh, giving record, then you need to have that in before uh, the 31st, or it can be postmarked by the 31st. So uh, we want to encourage you uh, to do what you need to do. We want to give you good information uh, about that. Uh, I also want to share with the deacons that uh, our pastor's improving, but he has suggested that we move the deacons meeting to January 10th. January 10th. So deacons, uh, you won't meet until January 10th. Okay? So good to see you here in the house of the Lord. I heard about about a half a dozen pastors and staff this last week that have caught COVID, and uh, one or two of them are in some serious condition. And so I want us to take a moment and pray for our pastor, his family, but also for uh, other staff members across our state and nation, and then for uh, those who are uh, suffering with COVID, uh, no matter what their job title. Okay, let's bow together and pray. Father, today you are our great physician, and so we come and we bow humbly before you. Lord, we are not directing you to give your blessings. Lord, we know that you are a sovereign God. And so, Lord, we uh, know that you see the big picture, and Lord, we don't underst always understand about suffering and why uh, good people suffer along with uh, those who uh, are not committed to your ways. But Lord, we come to you today asking you that you would bless all people who uh, are enduring affliction during this season. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give those who are manufacturing and distributing the vaccine uh, unusual ability to do great things. But Father, we trust you uh, because you have told us that you would take care of us. And Lord, we just simply, by faith, ask you to uh, take these, to bless them uh, physically, spiritually, mentally. Lord, we pray that in all ways you might bless people today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me this morning and let's sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold Go 
tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you. Be seated. During this year, we've been reading from the book of Psalms. I want to read Psalm 24 today. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. It's an important question asked here. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? If you desire to serve the Lord, this is a good question for you. It's an important question. In Exodus 39, verses 25 through 26, The scriptures describe the priestly garment, and one of its attributes was it had bells sewn across the hem of that garment, that robe, and it was not merely for decoration. As the priest went into the Holy of Holies, the bells let those outside know whether that priest was still living or not. You see, they believe that being clean before the Lord in that priestly position was a life and death matter. Some people have suggested that this psalm is, has been written as the Ark of the Covenant was being taken back into the city of Jerusalem. And you remember that there was Uh, one of those who was attending uh, the ark that simply put out his hand to steady it, to keep it from falling. And the scriptures tell us that that man who touched the ark of the covenant, that holy thing, perished. It was a serious thing to come before the Lord uh, to offer up sacrifices for his people. If we would serve the Lord, We need clean hands and a pure heart. We need to be serious about that. He goes on to say, They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Those who seek him. We've been singing out about shepherds and wise men who sought out the Christ child. And I'm reminded as a very young uh, boy receiving a Christmas card from one of my Sunday school teachers. And the caption on it is one we've all read before, wise men still seek him. If you would be wise in your life and have the blessing and favor of the Lord upon your life, it would do you well to seek him. And then this last section is, uh, has been uh, thought to be a song that was sung as the Ark of the Covenant came into uh, the city. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today asking that you would help us to mean business with you today. Lord, I pray that our worship today uh, might not just be happenstance, but Lord, I pray that you would give us a purpose and a preparation to worship you. And Lord, we pray that as we worship you on this day, 
that you might receive glory and honor and praise. Lord, we pray that our worship might be found pleasing to you. And Lord, we simply ask that you help us to kneel humbly before you and consider you our God, claim you as our Lord and as our Savior. And Lord, we give thanks for this Christmas season, the time in which you began your work of redemption anew for your people. Lord, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We three kings of Orient are. Lies he in such meanness 
favorite. It's a simple, simple Christmas song, but it points to our God and his work of salvation for our lives.
Sunday morning, December 27th, Lifeline Baptist Church. How are you all doing? Good. It is good to see you. I trust that everyone had a good Christmas. I won't ask if any of you all did not make it off of the naughty list, Richard Osborne. But hopefully, most of you, in fact, did, and you received good gifts. I know that, speaking of that one who may be on the naughty list I just mentioned, I was asked by him this past week where my lights were at, and I had to explain to him that that's only for special occasions. So, it's kind of a hard act to follow. Maybe I should have come up today with a New Year's hat, maybe a little horn or something, but no, I won't do that. I think stressing Brother Jeff out just one time in these last couple of weeks uh, is good enough, and I think that he probably would agree. But it is good to see you, good to be with you, and I do in fact hope that you all had a good Christmas, a Merry Christmas, and hopefully you all are looking to a happy uh, New Year. I know looking at 2020, all the blessings aside, certainly 2021, God willing, can't be anything other than a happy year, year, amen. But I do have a note for you all from Brother Jeff that I wanted to share before we get into our time of Bible study together. And it reads as following, praying for you all this morning, we are doing better. Ham still needs to improve. Ethan and Jane Ellen are better. I still have a cough, with which when talking to Brother Jeff, that was the struggle, and I guess continues to be a struggle, it is an absolutely unrelenting, unforgiving cough that he has. And so pray for that specifically. Letha is better. We love and miss Lifeline and look forward to being back. Thanks for all the love and prayer. So continue to pray for Brother Jeff, Miss Pam, Miss Letha, and the kids, the children, as they keep on keeping on in their battle against COVID. And in the meantime, we'll all do our due diligence to take care of ourselves, to take care of our family members, and to look out for one another in hopes of once and for all nipping this disease in the bud. Let me go ahead, if you don't mind, and open us up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to continue on uh, in our journey together through the book of Romans. So let me open up in a word of prayer, and then we will dive right into our time together in Scripture. Father, thank you so much for this yet another opportunity that you've given us to gather together as your people, as the body of Jesus Christ, as the family of faith that gathers here at Lifeline Baptist. Father, I do thank you for this past Christmas holiday and all that it means as we celebrate, as we honor, as we reflect on the perfect sinless life of our Lord Jesus, that he lived on our behalf because we cannot, the payment, the punishment that he took on that gruesome cross, again, taking the weight of our sin and the sin of the world upon himself so that we would not have to, being buried in a borrowed tomb, but not staying in that tomb and three days later being resurrected from the dead so that we too, because of our faith in our Lord Jesus and what he has done on our behalf, can have the promise of life after death, the hope of salvation from sin and death and hell. This is Christmas. This is why we celebrate. And no matter how difficult it may have been this past Christmas for some of us, in light of changes that we have experienced, I pray that we would always keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and that we would run this race with endurance, and that we would not give up a single inch until our Lord Jesus stares us in the face. He reaches out for us and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my rest. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as we started this past week, we are in a new study series, the book of Romans. And so if you have a Bible of sorts, whether it's paper or digital, I invite you to turn to the book of Romans. And while I don't want to repeat everything that we talked about, it has been a week and there's been some things that have taken place in this past week, a busy week. And so I think that it would behoove us to at least do a little bit of review, not anything that's exhaustive, but just to be sure we're all on the same page and starting off together as we hopefully move into the second verse of Romans chapter 1 as we spent the entire time we had last week together in just one verse. 
So by way of introduction, again, we know that the author of the book of Romans is none other than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. And he was writing to the Christians in Rome and believers everywhere. I know that you all will recall that the Apostle Paul uh, had not been to Rome. He had not been to this church. He did not help establish this church. Uh, it is believed that some of the uh, Jewish believers who had gathered for Pentecost, uh, after having left Pentecost, they, as they migrated out, started this church. But Paul wanted to come, and he wanted to be able to visit this church. Uh, but he was going to basically bring a collection to Jerusalem for the poor Christians there before making his way uh, on to Rome. Uh, when was it written? It was written about A.D. 57, and again, the point we made last time we were together is as we're thinking about our faith, and as we're thinking about the inspiration uh, and the collection of scriptures, it's always good to be reminded as to when a book is written, especially in light of or relative to the, the life of Christ, and so we know that this book was not written too terribly long after the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ, some 20 plus years uh, the different places that are important to make note of in this book are Corinth, which is where Paul is writing from, and obviously Rome. And the purpose, other than the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, that Paul would write this, as far as the, the reason for his writing, was to introduce himself to the Romans and to give a sample of his message before he arrives. If you were to look at the book of Romans as a whole, and again, I know I share with you all that it has been said that if you are a new Christian or if you are a maturing Christian and you want to know the whole of Christian theology, you can find the whole of Christian theology in Romans chapter, chapters 1 through 11. Basically, in Romans chapter, chapters 1 through 11, he tells us what to believe. He tells us what to believe. And then in chapter 12, he starts in on how to behave. Basically, now that you have this information, now that you have this truth, now that you have this theology, this is how you put it into practice. And so again, that's how you might break down a blueprint of the book of Romans. So we looked at last week, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And we spent a great deal of time, we spent our entire time, I should say, in just verse 1. Uh, we have one of our seminarians here with us, Sean Carney, back from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City. Sean, uh, I think one of the hallmarks of whenever you become what we might describe as a professional preacher is when you can make an entire message out of one verse, okay? I'm just saying, just throwing it out there, something to look forward to, just, just teasing with you a, a bit there. But we looked at verse 1 in Romans chapter 1, and I am reading from and preaching out of the New American Standard, but it says this, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, and we just kind of camped out there. I just, I, there's just something about it. I just love to read that verse, and I love to read that portion of that verse. I could just sit right now and camp out and talk about what it means to be a bondservant, but we won't because we've already done that. But Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So we talked about what does it mean, what does it mean to be a bondservant. And here again, we'll not belabor this point. We talked about it in length last time we were together. But in short, what we described was that a bondservant in the Greek is a doulos, a doulos, a slave, one who is in permanent relation of servitude to another. One who is in permanent relation of servitude to another. So much to be said about just even those words as it pertains to our relationship with Jesus Christ, our daily pursuit of him, and how it is that we're to live our faith out each and every day. And so the question we ask is, can it be said of us? that we are in a permanent relationship of servitude. Not that we're not saved, not that we're calling into question our salvation, but can it be said of us, can it be described of us, that we are living out a permanent relation of servitude. And the other part of the definition that I love as well, his will altogether consumed in the will of the other. His will altogether consumed in the will of the other. Basically, it's not about me. It's not about what I think that I need or want, not to sound cliche, but it in fact is all about Jesus. And it, is, it is about his will. Similar to the Lord Jesus whenever he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he is fully aware of what he has already gone through, what he is about to go through, and so on and so forth. 
And in that moment of humanity, as he's praying, the scripture says that, that he prayed such that he had drops of blood, which for those that might be naysayers to the Christian faith, that in fact is an actual medical condition where you have, I think, little capillaries or, or, or such that, that burst in your sweat glands during times of extreme distress and angst. And therefore, there is blood that comes out mixed with sweat. So the Lord Jesus was in such angst and distress in this moment of humanity where he's asking the Father, knowing what he's about to have to endure, Father, if there's any way, and you're, I'm paraphrasing, that we can do this a different way, that we can make this cup pass over, let's do that. But the phrase that we know that he finishes with, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This being the picture-perfect epitome of what it means of being a bondservant, of having a will that is altogether caught up and consumed the will of the other. Yes, I have my human desires. I have my, my dreams and my aspirations and this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, it is absolutely, positively all about Jesus and what he wants. And if any, and if any way, shape, form, or fashion, what I think that I need or what I think that I want runs contradictory to what the will of God is, if you'll pardon the expression, whatever it is that's in me that's contradictory to the will of God, it must die. It must die. It cannot be if I'm to be a doulos, if I'm to be a bondservant, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can tell I get fired up about this. It's good stuff. We talked about being set apart. We talked about how it is that every person, whenever you, if you will again, pardon the expression, when you sign on the dotted line to be a, a Christ follower, what you do not sign up for, and I know that I said last time we were together that this is a moot point in Lifeline Baptist Church because you all are workers. You all are servants. And I thank God for you, and I thank God for that. But whenever we sign up to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what we don't sign up for is to be a pew sitter. But what we do sign up for is to be a God server. And we all have a specific calling on our lives to fulfill the perfect and sovereign and eternal will of God. We talked about, among those things, being the propagation of the gospel. What was the gospel? What is the gospel? What will always be the gospel? We shared from 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day. And that truth being absolutely positively transformative to anybody who had placed their faith in Jesus Christ and all that he accomplished as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, all those things being said, let us dive into verses 2 and 3, shall we? So it says this in verse 2 and in verse 3, in light of what we just read in verse 1. Which he, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now, let me remind us that these first few verses are really just introductory in nature. You don't get into, even though this is good stuff we've already discussed, as far as the whole of what to believe theologically, we don't really get into that subject matter until we get out of these first few verses in chapter 1. This really is the Apostle Paul it's kind of an intimate moment from the Apostle Paul where he introduces himself. He tries to acquaint himself with the church at Rome. And so these are some of the things that he shares kind of from his heart before moving on to the weightier matters of the letter. But in these verses, what he's talking about is, among other things, the gospel. And what he's talking about is that the gospel had been promised through the prophets, namely, specifically, some of the Old Testament prophets. One such prophet that I want to remind us of is Jeremiah. Jeremiah showing us a passage of Scripture that when we look at Romans, when we look at other passages, we see the fulfillment of said Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6 say this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
And I want for you to remember that Jeremiah, as the, the Spirit of God is moving in him and is moving through him, and as he's speaking these words, some of these words that he uh, doesn't even necessarily, the same as some of the other prophets, understand as to what their meaning is or what the finality of what he's saying is going to be. The Holy Spirit is inspiring him to, to say these things hundreds of years before Christ would even come and fulfill them which is an amazing thing in and of itself. And we're going to talk in just a moment, kind of an aside, that I hope will be an encouragement to you in your faith, will be something that strengthens you in your faith, especially in this crazy COVID world where maybe you've had questions and maybe you've had concerns. And maybe similar to our devotion that we had on Wednesday night is we talked about God's timing. We talked about from Galatians 4.4, at just the right time, Christ came. But the questions that we ask over and over again in our devotion, God, where are you? And God, what are you up to? And God, when are you going to intervene on my behalf? If you have struggled with any of those kinds of questions, or anything else for that matter, in 2020, I hope that this passage will serve as, again, hopefully an encouragement and hopefully some sort of strength that, in fact, our faith is true. It is real. It is trustworthy. A life can and should be built upon it. And so we want to talk about that. But again, Jeremiah, chapter 23, looking at verses 5 and 6. If you'll allow me to, let me back up and start again. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Not too long ago, <clears throat> excuse me, our youth got together in an attempt to go and look at Christmas lights, of which we will not speak of. <laughs> if you want to know how that went, I will tell you privately <laughs> and give you all the Advice that you need to not repeat the same experience. But before having left out for that adventure uh, with those patient saints who I think earned some jewels in their crown during that time, uh, we had a devotion before we left. And one of the, the devotion that we had was talking about basically can we trust the claims of Christ? Can we trust the claims of Christ? We are still in, I would, I would say, and I think you would agree, we are in the throes of the Christmas season. This season is all about Jesus Christ. Our society, our culture, our world, for the most part, has rearranged itself so as to commemorate this Jesus and to celebrate him. So in light of that, the question that I put forward to the students and that we talked about, and I'm going to share with you a segment of, is can you even trust the claims of Christ? Now you all understand I'm playing, if you'll again pardon the expression, Lord forgive me, playing the devil's advocate and trying to ask them a question that if they don't already have the answer to, I'm going to provide the answer in hopes of strengthening their faith so they'll have not only a stronger foundation and a better response to those who might question their faith as well. And so the question was, can you trust the claims of Christ? And so we were talking about a variety of different things, and I'll share with you just a, a tidbit of what we talked about. But one of the things that we talked about, and I'm trying to bring it all full circle here, in light of this passage that is a fulfillment, or speaks of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Listen, 2020 uh, has been enough to shake a lot of people to their core, amen? We don't celebrate that. We don't glamorize that. But it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year all the way around for a variety of reasons for a lot of people we can think about COVID which again we're not going to give it any more time than what it deserves which is none but you understand where I'm coming from if it's dealing with matters of COVID which our own family has been affected by it. my own wife her grandmother passed from COVID complications of COVID and so we're not immune to it maybe that's something that's shaken you to your core Maybe it's been a variety of other things. Maybe you've had other kinds of sicknesses or diseases, or maybe you've lost loved ones, or maybe you've had financial struggles, or maybe uh, marriage uh, difficulties, or so on and so forth. 
fill in the blank as to what your 2020 difficulty, your difficulties, plural, might be. And any of those things singularly, not to mention cumulatively, are enough to shake us to our core. And it's enough for us to ask, again, the question that I just made mention of, or the questions, God, where are you at? God, what are you up to? And God, when are you going to intervene on my behalf? And is this Christianity, is this faith that I have pledged my life to, can it be trusted? And is it worth its while? And I would say to you wholeheartedly, before I qualify my statement, I would say wholeheartedly, it is. And it will always be. And I would say to you, dear brother or sister, if you are in still right now a moment of, Lord, where are you at? What are you up to? And when are you going to intervene? I would say, hang on. Hang on. Don't give up. Don't give out. Hang on. So let me share with you just a moment. Again, something I think will help to strengthen your faith and to encourage you. Let's think about, for example, the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And those of you who are youth, you've heard this, so just humor me. Think about the events leading up to the, cruci the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read for you. I think you've got some of the things on the screen there, but just stay with me. In one day, and again, we're, we're talking about the central figure, Jesus Christ, upon which this season is, is built upon, our faith is placed into, and our whole lives are, are affected by Jesus. In one day, Jesus fulfilled no fewer than 29 specific prophecies. We're talking about, again, in the, in the hours and days leading up to his crucifixion. Jesus fulfilled no fewer than 29 specific prophecies spoken at least 500 years earlier. 29 prophecies 500 years earlier. Well, that may not seem like such a big deal to us just at kind of a glance. But let me share with you some more that hopefully will put it into perspective. There's a professor. He did an analysis, a reputable professor. It was reviewed by the American Scientific Association. And this is where I began to kind of lose uh, sight here because I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a statistics guy. I was a Spanish major uh, with good reason. But it states the probability of just eight prophecies. So think about it. Jesus fulfilled no less than 29 prophecies in those hours and days leading up to his crucifixion. He, he fulfilled 29, 2 9. The mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight, 21 less, just eight, look at this, is one in 10 to the 17th power. So that's one with a lot of zeros. I'm not even sure how to pronounce that number. Basically, in the natural realm, notice I say in the natural realm, because our God is not confined to the natural realm. Our God is supernatural. In fact, our God created the natural realm, and so therefore he's not bound by his own creation. But in the natural realm, this kind of a number, this kind of a statistic would basically find itself categorized in the area of impossible. It is impossible for somebody, a human, in the natural realm to fulfill eight prophecies written 500 plus years earlier. But Jesus fulfills no less than 29. And so again, it's one to the 17th power. I don't know if you're like me, but I like word pictures. So again, that number, all I know is it's a one with a lot of zeros. Let me read for, for you something real quickly to give you perspective. And I will say, uh, some of you all may not be as interested in this as I am. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a nerd. I, I confess that. I, I don't have any shame in that. Um, but if you want some of this material, I have it printed out and be glad to give it to you. You have all of the 29 prophecies and their scripture reference, etc. But let me, let me paint for you a word picture. Again, we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about, God, where are you at? What are you up to? And when are you going to intervene? And, and can you be trusted? Is it all worth it? Because this 2020 year has shaken me to my core and has left me with some questions and some, and some concerns and some doubts. So if you were to take 
that number that I'm making reference to, 1 to the uh, 17th power. If you did take that many silver dollars and spread them across the state of Texas, okay, a large state, spread them across the state of Texas, they would not only cover the entire state, but they'd, they would also form a pile of coins two feet deep. Two feet deep with that many coins. Now, if you take one more silver dollar, mark it with a big red X and toss it into that pile and stir the whole pile thoroughly, it gets better. Then blindfold yourself, starting at El Paso on the western border of the state. Walk the length and the breadth of that enormous state from Amarillo in the Panhandle to Laredo on the Rio Grande, all the way to Galveston on the Gulf of Mexico, stooping just once, stooping just once along the way to pick up a single silver dollar out of that two foot, two foot deep pile. Then take off your blindfold, look at the silver dollar in your hand. What are the chances that you would pick the, the marked coin out of a pile of silver dollars the size of the Lone Star State? The same chance that one person could have fulfilled just eight, just eight messianic prophecies in one lifetime. There is an expression, and to be honest with you, I don't know if he coined it or if it's something that he brought from somebody else. Some of you all may be familiar with Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell uh, is a very renowned Christian apologist. He and his son uh, do a lot of Christian apologetics, defending the Christian faith, basically providing all the tools that you need to be able to know what you believe and why you believe it and how to defend it. But Josh McDowell was the one that introduced me to this phrase. And again, I go back to this prophecy. I go back to the fulfillment of the prophecy as referenced in Romans. I go back to, can you trust the claims of Christ? I go back to our whole, our whole world being basically arranged around this person of Christ. I go back to, God, where are you at? And what are you up to? And when are you going to intervene on my behalf? And I think that what we're left with as we think about Jesus is this phrase that Josh McDowell shares in his writings, evidence that the man of verdict. And basically, when you think about the person of Christ, and you think about whether or not it is that you want to adhere to who he is as a person, whether or not that you want to pledge your life to him as Lord and surrender all that you have to him from this day forward, when you think about Jesus and all these terms, and you think about whether or not to make a decision for him, you're only left with three options. And the first is this, Jesus is a liar. Now, again, you all understand, I do not believe that. I do not believe that. With every fiber in my being, I think that Jesus Christ, as the scriptures proclaim, he is truth in the flesh. He is not a liar. But whenever you look at things like this, and when we think about, can we trust him? Can we trust Jesus? And where is he at? And what is he up to? And why is he not intervening? Why is he not working on my time? Well, maybe he's a liar. He is not a liar. He is not a liar. A liar does not fulfill no less than 29 prophecies spoken about himself no less than 500 years prior to his coming and his living and his dying. So you're either left with he's a liar. And again, I suggest to you, I proclaim to you that in fact he's not a liar. He's truth. Well, maybe he's a lunatic. Maybe he suffered with some sort of a God complex wherein he thought that he was a little more than what he was. We've all met some of those individuals, and not being ugly or critical, out in our society who are mentally unhealthy, and they've proclaimed themselves as being the Messiah, this, that, and the other. Maybe Jesus just, he was in that same camp. There is no indication whatsoever in all of Scripture. You can look at individuals who are experts in this field. Jesus demonstrates no indication whatsoever that he was anything less than mentally holy, fit, and sound, and healthy. He was not a lunatic. He was not a lunatic. So then what option are we left with? He was either a liar, he was either a lunatic, or he's Lord. He's Lord. And the question for us is, 
what is he to us? Who have we decided that he is in our own life? Because again, 2020 has been a crazy year. And maybe we've had questions and maybe we've had concerns and maybe we've had doubts and maybe we've had complaints and maybe we've had all sorts of things as it pertains to health, as it pertains to finances, as it pertains to marriage, as it pertains to children, as it pertains to school, as it pertains to fill in the blank. And again, we've wondered, God, where are you at? And what are you up to? And when are you going to intervene? I would say to you again, hang on, dear brother and sister, hang on. And if you don't yet know Christ, I would say to you, please, among those options, liar, lunatic, Lord, please be convinced today by the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart that in fact Jesus Christ is who he said he was, who he said he is, who he said he will always be, the Lord of all creation, the unique, singular Savior of all humanity, the one and only way to the Father. No other way to have eternal life in a relationship with God. Let's continue on in this, these last few minutes that we have. Let's look at verse 4. Who has declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. When you're talking with young people and you're trying to explain to them the gospel, I have a distinct recollection, for example, of a conversation I had years ago in our youth room. And there was a young lady who had indicated that she wanted to become a Christian, that she wanted to come to Christ. And of course, I celebrated that and I encouraged that. But what I began to talk to her about was the gospel, what we already talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. And I talked to her about the sinless, perfect life. Do you believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless, perfect life? Yes, I can believe that. And do you understand why it is that that's significant? Yeah, I can understand that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ went to a cross and was crucified on your behalf so that I wouldn't have to do it and you wouldn't have to do it? He paid the, the penalty and the punishment for our sins. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Can you understand why that's significant? Yes. Do you believe that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later he rose from the dead? I'm not sure I can believe that. I'm not sure I can believe that. And of course, the conversation had to stop right there. I didn't judge her. I didn't condemn her. I didn't make her feel anything less than what she was. But I tried to, as best I could, uh, explain to her why that that was important. And I lovingly and respectfully told her that we could talk about it some more. But until that she could believe that the resurrection was real, that she couldn't be a Christian because it's the cornerstone of our faith. Why is it so important? Again, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul tells us why it's so important. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some, of, some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Combating a fallacy, a heresy that's being taught but if there is no resurrection of the dead, so now the Apostle Paul is again kind of playing the devil's advocate. Okay, I'm going to go along with you for a moment. And let's just assume, let's just suppose for a second that what you're saying is correct. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. What I'm doing right now, useless. What you're doing right now, useless. If the resurrection, in fact, did not take place, we know that it did. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. What we say about the resurrection is not true. And we're spreading falsehoods, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Your faith is worthless if Christ hasn't been raised. But amen, praise God, Jesus Christ was raised to never die again. And because of that, our faith is not worthless. In fact, there is no value or worth that we can even place on our faith. It's beyond measurement, beyond comprehension because of what it affords to us, because of what Jesus did on our behalf. 
your faith is worthless, you're still in your sins. But then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have already passed away in Christ, have perished. But if we have hoped in only this life, we are, all, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection, as you all know, is vital, is pivotal. The Christian faith cannot exist without it. We cannot exist without it. So what does this resurrection mean for us as we begin to wrap up? There is no kind of sin. There is no manner of death. And there is no power of hell that can prevail against us. Did you hear what I just said? There is no kind of sin. There is no manner of death. And there is no power of hell that can prevail against us because of the resurrection. So come what may, Lord Jesus, I choose to follow you because I know that you're not a liar or a lunatic. You're Lord. I know that I can trust you. And I know that even though you may not be working on what I think is my timetable, you're working on your timetable and your timing is perfect. And I will wait and I will trust because you are good and your plans are best and that's what I want. Your will be done, not mine. Not mine. So as we get into our time of invitation, as we have done these last few weeks, I just simply have some questions that I want for us to ponder. I have some questions that I want to re uh, us to reflect on. I have some questions that I want for us to, in our hearts and in our minds, and if we need to come forward publicly, and pull aside, pull aside myself or Brother Clay or any of our deacons or whoever to let somebody know I'm making this decision today, I want for you to be able to do that. So I'm going to ask for every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed as we go into our time of invitation. And as we have over and over again, I invite you to come forward if you would like to come forward. We can safely and socially distanced talk with one another. Myself, Brother Clay, one of our deacons, I invite you to come forward if you would like to come forward, if the Lord is leading you to come forward. If you feel more comfortable sitting where you're at, doing business with the Lord, by all means. You listen to him and you do what he has to say. But I'd ask for every head to be bowed. I'd ask for every eye to be closed. I know we're going to have a little bit of soft music being played as we reflect and as we respond. My first couple of questions that I have are for those who are believers. My first question is this. Maybe this pandemic, maybe this pandemic or just life in general has shaken your faith and you want to commit your life to Christ as Lord afresh and anew. You know that what you have experienced and what you have gone through in 2020 has shaken you to your core. You've had questions, you've had concerns, you've had complaints, you've had heartbreak, you've had whatever. And you want to say to the Lord Jesus afresh and anew, Lord Jesus, I know that you are not liars, you're not lunatic, but you are Lord. Help me to understand what I need to understand. Help me to understand it in the time that I need to understand it. But in the meantime, Lord Jesus, help me to hang on to you closely and tightly and to follow you every step of the way. Maybe that's something that some of you all need to do as Christians. Maybe some of you all are not living in the full awareness and power of the resurrection, knowing that no manner of sin, no kind of death, no scheme of hell, can prevail against you you've not been living in that fullness you've not been living in that truth and you want to forge forward victorious not in defeat but victorious because of what Jesus has accomplished in the resurrection and again you want to afresh and anew as a Christian take hold of that resurrection power and move forward into 2021 as a person who's living in victory and not in defeat if you need to come forward just to tell somebody about that or to do business with God where you are at, we welcome you to do that. And then maybe there are some of you that God is calling to a special ministry. You want to share it with the church. We want to celebrate that with you. Maybe God is calling you and your family to membership 
at Lifeline Baptist Church. Or maybe, maybe, last but certainly not least, you're not yet a Christian and you'd like to give your life to Christ today. You know that you're sin sick. You know that you're broken. You know that you need forgiveness, cleansing, salvation. And you know that Jesus is the only remedy for that. I invite you to come forward to talk to myself or Brother Clay. And we'd be glad to introduce you to our Lord Jesus, who, as we've already said, can be trusted. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He is Lord. And he's the best thing that could ever happen to you. I'm going to close this in prayer. You feel free to come forward. Pull us aside. I'll have a couple of closing comments, and we'll call it a day. Let's pray together as we conclude. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Father, thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. Father, speak to our hearts. Father, strengthen us, comfort us. You know where we're at. You know what it is that we have gone through. You know what it is that we are going through. And Father, we confess to you, not that it's any different any moment of any day, but we confess to you that we need you, Lord Jesus. We need you every hour, Lord Jesus. We need you. Father, if there is, in fact, anybody here that needs to make a decision of any kind, whether it be a Christian making a decision or whether it be somebody needing to, to come to know Christ for the first time, I pray that you would give them the courage that they need to come forward and to speak out and to make public what it is that God is doing in their life. Father, help us to go out of here as your people who live with Jesus lifted high so that a lost and dying world can be drawn unto him and unto salvation. Again, we love you. We need you. Bring us back again safely the next time we gather. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So by way of announcements, just real quickly before we leave, uh, and certainly, as I've already said, if you need to talk to us, please feel free to come forward and to talk to us. We would be glad to talk to you. Uh, we should be going on this coming week, as far as I know, everything as usual, Wednesday night Bible study, and then gathering again uh, this coming Sunday for worship and Bible study. So good to see all of you. Uh, if you need me, don't hesitate to call me. We hope that you all have a good rest of your Sunday and a very happy new year. Love you all so much. You are dismissed. Have a great day. Let me get this camera out of here.